There is one story that parents have used for hundreds of years to scare their children at night, and that is the story of the Snellygaster. Our story begins in Maryland in the 1700s. The German immigrants who settled there were first to tell stories of their towns and settlements being attacked by flying monsters. And their descriptions of these monsters were perplexing. They were half-bird, half-reptile creatures. They didn't have much of a face, but instead a huge metallic beak lined with razor-sharp teeth. Sometimes, people claimed, the creature would swoop down from the skies and grab people with octopus-like tentacles. Others said that it looked more like a demon, with dragon-like wings, with claws at the end, sometimes covered with fur, wearing goat-like horns, but always with that long, reptilian tail. These early German-American immigrants called the creature the Schnellergeist, which translates to quick ghost. And over the years, Schneller Geist transformed into Snelly Gaster. To ward off the Snelly Gaster, German immigrant farmers decorated the outsides of their barns with a five-pointed star. It was said that this lucky charm would repel the creature, which is why even today the five-pointed star is a common sight above the doors of German-American barns. Some say the Snallygaster was seen in North America long before German immigrant settlers ever arrived. Native Americans have long depicted winged creatures in their murals and other artwork. One of these such creatures is the Piazza Bird. At one time, there was a Native American painting of the Piazza Bird on the bluffs of the Mississippi River in Alton. In the 1870s, the Mississippi Lime Company quarried away this artwork, not recognizing its value at the time, but the painting had been preserved in sketches, and it was reproduced by modern artists and can now be found near the Mississippi River on a bluff near its junction with the Illinois River. Even though this particular drawing was found in Alton, Illinois, description of this creature is surprisingly similar. In 1836, a man named John Russell, a professor of Greek and Latin at Shirtliff College in Alton, Illinois, wrote an article that some have since called imaginative, recounting the native story of the Piazza Bird. The Piazza Bird was huge and would live in the cliffs. Nearby Native American villages had been at war for some time, and the Piazza Bird had acquired the taste of human flesh from eating the corpses left over from those battles. One of the local chiefs, Chief Watoga, ordered his bravest warriors to hide near the entrance of the Piazza Bird's cave. Chief Watoga knew that the bird was perched in the nearby clifftops, and so with his men hidden, he walked towards the entrance to the cave to act as bait. When the Piazza Bird saw him, it flew down from the cliffside and attacked, but his warriors leapt from their concealment and slew the Piazza Bird with a volley of poisoned arrows. It was then that Chief Watoga and his tribe painted the mural to commemorate the event. Could this Piazza Bird with wings and scales and a reptilian tail be the very same Snallygaster seen by German-American immigrants? The years went on after these early sightings, and the Snallygaster faded away, becoming a distant memory of earlier days. Until in 1909, the Middletown Valley Register newspaper ran a front-page story, Beware the Snallygaster. The paper told the story of a man named Bill Jefferson. Bill was just walking down a peaceful country road when all of a sudden a flying monster dove down upon him. The creature carried Bill Jefferson to the top of a nearby hill and proceeded to pierce his jugular vein with its needle-like beak, slowly sucking his blood while gently fanning the man with a set of enormous wings. After draining Bill Jefferson of every ounce of blood, the Snallygaster tossed his lifeless body down the hillside and disappeared into the night sky. The paper described the Snallygaster as having, quote, enormous wings, a long pointed bill, claws like steel hooks, and one eye in the center of its forehead. 
It made screeches like a locomotive whistle. And the paper went on to tell the story of a group of brave men who fought the winged terror for an hour and a half outside the Emmitsburg train station before they finally managed to chase it off into the woods. The article was an immediate sensation. Other newspapers picked it up, and reports of the Snallygaster began to spread across America. Frenzy about the Snallygaster became so high-pitched that the Smithsonian Institution offered a reward for the hide of the creature, and then U.S. President Theodore Teddy Roosevelt even considered postponing his African safari to personally hunt the Snallygaster. Sightings of the Snallygaster didn't stop there. These sightings even happened as far away as West Virginia. The Shepherdstown Register from Shepherdstown, West Virginia reported a Snallygaster sighting perched atop the craggy cliffs about a mile above town. Then the Hagerstown Mail reported that the same Snallygaster was seen a few days later perched on a railroad bridge. A few days later, the Shepherdstown Register reported that the Snallygaster laid an egg in a barn belonging to a man named Alex Crow. The egg was huge, and men from the town even tried to put it in an incubator, hoping that it would hatch, but it never did. The Snallygaster eventually met its end in the small town of Frog Hollow, Maryland. Some locals were brewing up a 2,500-gallon vat of moonshine. The aroma was so compelling that the Snallygaster swooped on by to see what was going on. But as it flew overhead, fumes from the boiling mash wafted up and overcame the Snallygaster, causing him to plummet to the earth. He landed in the boiling vat where he drowned. The body of the Snallygaster was discovered in the vat a short time later by government agents who had received a tip about the illegal moonshine still. They arrived on the scene in Frog Hollow, only to find the corpse of the strangest creature they'd ever seen floating in the vat. The two agents were so perplexed that they didn't know what else to do. They were there to destroy moonshine, and that is what they did. They placed 500 pounds of dynamite under the still and ignited it, blowing up the moonshine, and at the same time, the body of the Snallygaster. Thus, the Snallygaster came to an end, but not his legend. He has been seen a few times since then. In 1976, the Washington Post, of all places, sponsored a statewide search for the Snallygaster, though no one ever found it. That is the story of the Snallygaster in our own universe. But what about the Snallygaster in the Fallout universe? We'll start with learning what pre-war America thought about the Snallygaster. To do so, we need to head to Watoga. Making our way to the Watoga Estates, we can take the staircase all the way to the top level. There, next to the metro station, we find a concession stand. And lying on the countertop is Sideshow Snallygaster, Part 1. Welcome back, dear listeners. It's time once again to put aside all you think you know, all you believe to be true. Time to open your mind to the strange, bizarre, and sometimes terrifying world that exists in the shadows and fringes of our own, where myth, legend, and rumor are made real. Yes, it's time for more thrilling Tales from the West Virginia Hills. In tonight's thrilling story, Sideshow Snallygaster. The carnival has come to the Tyler County Fairgrounds. Billy Harding and his dad wander past the games and rides. Cotton candy in hand, peanut shells and popcorn crunching beneath their feet as a sideshow barker touts a frightful attraction. Hurry, hurry, hurry! Shows are a swindle, Billy. All just smoke and mirrors. But he said it had six legs. Oh, 
trust me, son. When you get inside, all you'll see is a, a shaved bear with extra legs glued on. Aw, Dad, please, I'm begging you. Billy, Billy! Whoa, whoa, slow down there, champ. Sorry, Miss Ari. Hi, Teddy. We were just in there looking at the Snallygaster. My dad says it's a fake. I tried, but it costs five tickets. Five tickets? It's gotta be real if it costs that much. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. You know, it was a carny who coined the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute. Dad. Anyway, when I didn't have enough tickets, I tried sneaking in. You did not. Did so. Sorry, Mr. H. <laughs> it's okay, Teddy. Your secret's safe with me. Gee, thanks. So, I went around the back, looking for a place to sneak under the tent, and overheard two workers say the snally gas to escape. Escaped? You're kidding. All right, all right. I, I, I hate to break it to you, boys, but that's just a publicity stunt to stir up intrigue. Those men were scared stiff. What should we do, Dad? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going home. If you two want to stay longer, then so be it. But what about the Snally Gaster? <laughs> like I said, no such thing. Just don't dawdle too long, understand? They're closing soon. Okay, Dad. You think he's right about it being fake? I don't know. Well, the only thing I have enough for is the fun house. Wanna go? Same here. Come on, it's this way. Something is loose at the carnival. But is it a menacing beast? Or just a cock and bull hoax? Tune in next time for the thrilling conclusion of Sideshow Snallygaster. Interesting. So the Snallygaster of the Fallout universe can't fly. But the Barker explains this to us, that at one time the creature could fly. But over the hundreds of years since then, it has evolved to the point where it is now ground-bound. Instead of wings, now it has six limbs. The Barker also said that the Snallygaster is an ancient creature. Is it coincidence that we find this holotape in the ruins of Watoga? In our universe, Watoga is a state park, but in the Fallout universe, they turned that state park into the city of Watoga. But Watoga is also the name of the Native American chief who allegedly lured the Piazza bird into a trap, whereupon his warriors poisoned it. Could this be the link we need to connect the Piazza bird to the Snallygaster? Is it a coincidence that Bill, the boy in this story, shares a first name with Bill Jefferson, the guy who was killed by the Snallagaster after the Snallagaster sucked out all his blood in the Middletown Valley Register article published February 12th, 1909? Could the other boy in this story, Teddy, be a reference to Teddy Roosevelt, who almost called off his African safari to hunt the Snallagaster in 1909? Or is this just a subtle reference to Bill and Ted's bogus adventure? Are we then to believe that this adventure is also bogus? Our story continues while exploring the Watoga Civic Center. Inside the Civic Center, we have to climb the stands until we find the section labeled B5. Turning around, if we look at the concessions countertop, we find Sideshow Snallygaster Part 2. Tonight, we bring you the final chapter of Sideshow Snallygaster. When last we left off, two boys, Billy and Teddy, were headed toward the funhouse, trying to shake off the upsetting rumor that a dangerous beast escaped its cage. Wow, this funhouse is bonkers.
say? Where are your parents, boys? We're here alone. But don't worry, we'll tell everyone all about this and how you saved our lives. I was afraid you might say that. What do you mean? What I mean is that there's good publicity and there's bad publicity. And I always need to make sure I'm in control of both. A close call like this could be the end of business. And I can't risk that now, can I? But, mister, we won't tell anyone if you don't want. We swear it, don't we, Teddy? Cross our hearts and hope to die? <laughs> well, now, I couldn't have said it better myself. Summertime, girl. The next day, the carnival pulled up stakes and moved on to the next town because the show must go on at any cost. Be sure to tune in next week for another thrilling chapter of Tales from the West Virginia Hills. So the Snallygaster has a tail and eyes in its back. We must remember, however, that this recording was a pre-war radio play written and published by Stephen H. Patterson. It was fictional entertainment and everybody knew it. But it could be that Patterson based his story on real events. After all, we know that the pre-war government was taking cryptids seriously. Heading to Sugar Grove, we can check in with everyone's favorite cryptid analyst, Beverly Solomon, to see what the government has learned about the Snallygaster. On her desk, we find cryptid sighting Snallygaster, October 4th. Beverly Solomon, cryptid analyst, 10477. Snallygaster witness report. Another interesting tidbit from the locals, this time about the Snallygaster. This one's for you, Teddy. All right, so the witness overheard a loud shrieking sound and was rushed by a dark shape in the woods. It was uh, leaping at them, or maybe flying. They took shelter in an old German settler's barn and it couldn't get at them, which is what really interested me. It screamed and hollered outside all night until dawn, but they knew the seven-pointed star on the wall outside would keep them safe. Yikes. Guess I know what my next tattoo's gonna be. This one's for you, Teddy? Was Beverly Solomon giving a shout out to Teddy Roosevelt who wanted to hunt the creature? Or was she addressing the boy we heard in the holotape, Teddy? Could the boy have been a real person? Could he have escaped from the carnival barker and gone on to tell his story of the Snallygaster? Whereupon the government picked it up and assigned the case to Beverly Solomon. Maybe the story on the holotape was true. It's also interesting how she mentioned the German settler's barn, which of course we know from our own universe's history had the five-pointed star. The star which was seen as a good luck charm that warded off evil spirits and monsters. That's why these people were safe in the barn. The Snallygaster couldn't go inside. And that's why Beverly Solomon was safe after she got the tattoo of the five-pointed star. Remember in my video on the Wendigo, it was after she got the tattoo that she personally met the Wendigo. But the Wendigo screamed and fled after seeing the tattoo of the star. Then, heading to the hunter's shack, we can see what Shelby O'Rourke had learned about the Snallygaster. In her terminal, under cryptids, we find an entry, Snallygaster. Sightings, zero. Descriptive traits, elongated snake or dragon-like body. Wings, possibly half bird. Sharp claws and beak. Evidence log, sharp claw marks on trees. Too large for a bear, took photos and casts. So poor old Shelby O'Rourke just isn't having any luck citing these cryptids. But the descriptions she gets from eyewitnesses are pretty spot on. It's interesting, however, that she attributed the locomotive sound to the Grafton monster. We know from having met the Grafton monster that it doesn't emit a locomotive type sound. However, in our own folklore, the Snallygaster did emit a sound described as a locomotive's whistle. Perhaps Shelby here got the two mixed up. At any rate, she doesn't have enough information. We finally get some concrete answers when we visit the ruins of the West Tech facility. I did a video on this place already, which you can watch here. 
In the Advanced Mutations Lab, we find the Advanced Mutations Lab Terminal. In this terminal, we learned that the scientists here at West Tech poisoned the drinking water of the nearby town of Huntersville with FEV, the forced evolutionary virus. They then used the military to kidnap the residents of Huntersville, bring them back here, where they experimented on them further with FEV. When reading test subject reports, we find one at the very top, Special Report, Containment Breach. Special Report generated January 3rd, 2078 at 10.42 a.m. Holotape Record generated. Test Subject AM-52 has breached containment. Tracking program initiated. Tracking unit signal, weak. Current whereabouts, and then it gives us some longitude and latitude coordinates. And when we look these coordinates up on a map, we find Huntersville. So whatever creature broke free from West Tech made a beeline straight for Huntersville. And we understand why. Because Huntersville is where this person lived before he or she became AM-52. Subject extremely dangerous. Kill or recapture on sight. So Subject AM-52 broke free. But what was Subject AM-52? Scrolling down, we can read entry, report, Test Subject AM-52, October 14th, 2077, Phase 2 Combination Strain FEVS006443 has finally taken to Test Subject AM-52 and not resulted in a pile of quivering genetic bio-waste. AM-52 combines traits that resemble a number of different species. The results are disturbing, to say the least, but we have learned valuable insights into what these new strains are capable of. Most notable about this subject are the number of ocular organs along the enlarged upper torso, a second set of arms ending in clawed digits, and a large, sickle-shaped claw on each inner toe. That a living, stable, functioning subject seems to be sustaining itself normally is a major accomplishment for the program. We will keep subject AM-52 in isolated containment for observation until AM-53 has finished incubating. If the two are able to cohabitate along with a standard mutated human test subject, we may try reintroducing them to the Huntersville site for further study. We learned from my last episode that AM-53, after incubating, turned into the Grafton Monster. It somehow escaped from West Tech after the bombs dropped, and it appears, based on this description, that AM-52 was the Snallygaster. A second set of arms ending in claw digits, with four arms and two legs, that's... Six limbs, just like the Snellygaster from the audio plays. And a number of ocular organs along the enlarged upper torso. Didn't Bill and Ted from the holotape say that it was covered in eyes? We learned that the Enclave knew about the Snellygaster. For if we delve into the White Springs bunker, there we find a picture of the Snellygaster. Six limbs, a long tongue, and eyes on its torso. Interesting that it doesn't have a long tail, like the legend from our own universe. But we have a slight problem here. The story that Beverly Solomon told us was recorded on October 4th, 2077. And even then, this was a recording of a story she had heard at some time in the past. But test subject AM-52 wasn't even created at West Tech until October 14th, 2077. 10 days after Beverly recorded her holotape. And AM-52 didn't break free of West Tech until January 3rd of 2078, the next year, after the bombs dropped. So the Snallygaster that Beverly Solomon's eyewitness saw couldn't be AM-52. We run into the same problem that we had with the Grafton Monster. Either test subject AM-52 coincidentally mutated to resemble the description of a fictional legendary creature, or there really was a pre-FEV Snallygaster roaming the hills of West Virginia. And it's just a coincidence that the Snallygaster produced by West Tech happened to look just like it. 
The Snallygaster of the Fallout universe differs significantly from the one in ours. Instead of wings capable of flight, it has six limbs and attacks with its claws. Instead of a metallic beak, it has a fleshy, bulbous mouth covered in sharp, pointy teeth. Instead of a single eye in the middle of its head, it has dozens of eyes all over its body. And instead of a long reptilian tail, it has a long, rubbery, fleshy tongue that it uses as a whip to strike enemies with. And it can spit balls of acid. The Snallygaster is probably one of the most common cryptids in Fallout 76. We can find the Snallygaster as part of a number of events. They can spawn during the Primal Cuts seasonal event during Meat Week. They can be a target during the Queen of the Hunt event. We can find them in the ruins of Charleston, near to the Capitol building close to where we found the Grafton monster. They appear at Toxic Larry's Meat and Go and at Federal Disposal Site HZ-21. And that is the full story of the Snallygaster in Fallout 76. Where have you found the Snallygaster in your own game? Are you horrified to learn that the Snallygaster is really a mutated human infected by FEV? Share with me your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop. Lion's Pride. The Brotherhood does its best, but sometimes they need something special. That's where Lion's Pride comes in. Sport your love of Lion's Pride with this brand new design. It comes on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find it on other products as well, like smartphone cases, mugs, posters, prints, stickers, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.